don't be scared of the word mysticism. The woo pseudo spiritual nonsense that probably comes to mind might be popular right now, but it's a distorted image that has very little to do with the real thing. So let's cut through all the platitudes and the riddles and the whole super spiritual atmosphere. Straight talk, what is mysticism? And what is Christian mysticism? In any religion, mysticism is the search for a real personal experience of union with the divine. The personal experience of the divine transforms the mystic and makes her divine, creating an intersection of the spirit world and the physical world in the soul, body, and life of the mystic. Christian mysticism is the search for union with God through Jesus Christ. To get there, well, that's the story of the whole Bible. In the beginning, God creates. There is something and it's very good. But like any good artist, God isn't done until God sees God looking back at God from what God has made. That's where we come in. Genesis 1.27 says that God created us, male and female, in God's image. Human beings are God's image in that we're conscious creatures. We wonder and debate and write stories and build religions about where we came from and what it means to be human. It also means we're powerful creatures. Like God, we can reshape the natural world for our benefit. And our proper place in the natural order is to use those godlike abilities to participate in God's work, in the creation and protection and flourishing of life. But Genesis 3 tells us that very early on in the human story, something breaks. Our desire for more power than what we were given teaches us judgment, shame, and deep dissatisfaction. We're tricked by ambition and by the illusion of a fully godlike understanding, but when it doesn't work out, the only thing we really learn is to hate ourselves for what we're not. We become alienated from our divine source and our human purpose. Our spiritual consciousness short circuits. We're lost. And powerful creatures like us, when we're judgmental, ashamed, dissatisfied, and lost, when we hate ourselves, but are still ambitious, the result is nothing less than global disaster. It only takes the Bible seven chapters to chart our decline from the image of God, to banishment from paradise, to murder, the perversion of nature, to the worldwide destruction of the flood. The rest of the Bible describes the world as we still know it today. Famine, war, slavery, rape, pollution, and death. But it also tells a courageous story of hope. In every age, in every human disaster, God is still with us, pointing to a future when heaven and earth will be reconciled brought back together through human beings, when nature will be restored to health, peace, and flourishing through healed people. The best part is that God doesn't promise a reconciliation through the efforts of the best, most ambitious, or most powerful of us. God promises to work healing and new life through the weakest, the smallest, the forgotten, the humble. The human appetite for power is what's killing the world. Human humility, love, and self-sacrifice animated by God's own power is what will save it. So the New Testament opens with God entering the world through the life of a lower middle class carpenter's son whose mother had a bit of a reputation. Humble beginnings to say the least, but in the life of this one man, the Spirit of God demonstrated what true humanity, what life as the image of God can actually look like. Jesus taught, fed, healed, and honored the poor. He forgave, loved, and accepted every kind of sinner. He liberated people from their emotional burdens, from their anxieties, and their deepest wounds. He taught a way of life in harmony with God, in harmony with other people, and in harmony with the natural world. The writer of Hebrews calls him the exact imprint of God's very nature. So Jesus is what we were always meant to look like. Then, when Jesus didn't cave to ambitions of greatness, to the temptation to use power and violence, to fix a world broken by power and violence, we did what we always do with things we don't understand or that aren't like us. We killed him. But he rose from the dead and his teachings lived on in the lives of his followers. Jesus' resurrection showed the world that death is not the inevitable end, that willing self-sacrifice can and does give birth to reconciliation and new life. Jesus' first followers imitated him by sharing his life with the world. They told his story, but they also followed in his footsteps by setting tables all over the world for the poor, the outcasts, the weak, the brokenhearted. 
In their lives, the life of Jesus lived on, and they called this the Holy Spirit. What Jesus taught, and more importantly, what he demonstrated himself, was that loving and being loved by God and loving your fellow creatures as you love yourself is the path to becoming truly human. Of course, that's easy to remember and it makes a great mission statement, but day to day, it's incredibly hard to do. Later generations of Christians spent a lot of time thinking about why it's so hard to be like Christ and love consistently. What they came up with after generations of soul searching was a deeper understanding of the complexity of the human creature. In each of us, countless appetites, instincts, strengths, and weaknesses all push and pull us in a hundred different directions every moment of every day. As the Apostle Paul writes, parts of us naturally want to be Christ-like, but we have so, so many other parts. What the early Christian nuns, monks, and mystics realized was that all of our internal forces need to be trained if they're ever going to align with the teachings and example of Jesus. So they developed practices that open the human soul to the work of the Holy Spirit. Disciplines that wrestle our conflicted internal motivations into submission to the cross of Christ and the law of love. Why disciplines? Because the early mystics taught that in Christ, God became human to make human beings like God. But they also knew that God doesn't force this on us. God invites and leaves the response to the invitation up to us. The practices and disciplines that make us more like Christ, that teach us to consciously receive the love of God, consciously love God in return, and give of ourselves for the life of the world, these practices are a personal, intentional, involved response to God's work in Jesus Christ. A dedicated, committed, daily search for transforming union with the divine, or simply mysticism. A Christian mystic is someone who dedicates their life to imitating Christ as they are able and as God calls them to, in their internal spirit and in their outward behavior. As mystics become more like Christ, they become more truly human, which mysteriously leads them to become more personally united with God. We're all still waiting for that cosmic reconciliation when all of nature will find the peace and harmony with God that it's crying out for. But the great healing can start right now small and personal in each of us as we learn to be like Christ and connect with the source of our lives. That is the path of Christian mysticism, the search for oneness with God through intentional oneness with Jesus Christ. My name is John and I've been exploring Christian mysticism academically and in my own practice for a few years now. I think it has a lot of potential to help people really engage with the person and mission and spirit of Christ in ways that just aren't accessible anywhere else. But one thing I've noticed is that throughout Christian history, mysticism has been kind of a specialist thing for monks and nuns and hermits and the occasional theologian. But I think we can do better. I think there's so much depth and guidance in the mystical tradition that can really benefit non-specialist people today as we search for meaning and for God in confusing times. People who drive trucks for a living or have 12 kids who go to churches or who aren't into the whole church thing. So I'm still exploring and I'm still learning and thinking about what a mystical life looks like right now. And whoever you are, if your soul aches for more of God, you're in good company. I'm inviting you to come along on my exploration. If you wanna learn more about Christian mysticism, including practices of Christ-likeness that you can start today, subscribe to this channel. Uh, in the comments, let me know what you think, your thoughts, your concerns, your questions, and I'll do my best to respond to those and I'll see you next time until Christ is formed in us.